All right, good evening and welcome to this Tuesday, May 17, 2022, meeting of the Raymore Planning and Zoning Commission. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll move into our roll call. I know Commissioner Bowie is absent this evening. Here's that Commissioner Ingert is absent. He will be. Family emergency earlier, and he's getting his affairs in order to make it here. Very About good. Five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Faulkner. Present. Vice Chair Pfizer. Present. Commissioner Manser. Present. Secretary Peterman. Present. Commissioner Kia. Present. Mayor Turnbow. Here. And Chairman Wiggins is here. Uh, we have no personal appearances scheduled tonight, so we will move into our consent agenda, which we have two items this evening. Item A, the approval of minutes from the April 19th, 2022 meeting. And item B, case 22013, the Raymore Commerce Center second final plat. Um, I would entertain a motion to dispose one or both of those items separately, please. Mr. Chair. Sir. I move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Faulkner, second by Secretary Peterman to accept the consent agenda in discussion of the topic. All in favor? All opposed? Abstentions? Thank you, sir. It'll be 601 for the record. Um, we have no unfinished business this evening, so we will move into new business tonight. Uh, that is case 22012, the Raymore Commerce Center South PUD rezoning. This does require a public hearing, which I will open at this time at 7.02. Um, and with that, um, I would invite the applicant to please come forward to present your case. Real quick, commissioners, I'm gonna take your screen over. There's a video by the applicant. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Carl A. Van Trust Real Estate, 4900 Main Street, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Mayor Turnbow, Mr. Chairperson, members of the Planning Commission, members of city staff, uh, Van Trust is quite pleased tonight to be presenting to you our case for uh, rezoning of the property that we call Raymore Commerce Center South. Uh, for the purposes of tonight, but really it's going to, in our minds, an extension of Raymore Commerce Center, the development. Uh, so I thought it appropriate to open with a short video. Uh, this is from our website, raymorecommercecenter.com. Uh, it's a marketing video that describes uh, the Raymore Commerce Center development. Uh, we like uh, Raymore and the Kansas City metro area uh, for its proximity to uh, pretty much anywhere in the country, two to three days shipping. Raymore's positioned very nicely in the metro area uh, with great access off of Interstate 49. Um, and then as far as employees go that work in these types of buildings, there's great, great amenities very close. And so that's something that actually we've heard as we've toured tenants through our buildings. Uh, what, what amenities are close by, uh, tell us about the workforce. So these are all pluses uh, for this development in, in Raymore. Uh, building three is under construction right now, as well as building two. Building one, uh, you may notice, is, was completed in 2021 uh, and was sold to a, an owner user, uh, a beverage distribution company. Um, so these, these buildings, this is the quality and, and the type of building you can expect to see and continue into the Raymore South development. Uh, concrete tilt wall construction, heavy duty asphalt and, and concrete pavement sections. Uh, so really what they call is a class A uh, industrial and logistics uh, warehouse type building. We've had uh, two tours in the last four weeks uh, for building one and both were looking for somewhere between 500 and 800,000 square feet, which for us would be the whole building. We, we would set that up to lease the whole building and, and there's definitely interest there. So we've responded to two, pro, two requests for proposals. So there's really good activity uh, in, uh, for this product type. Um, and so, like I said, we, we think this uh, will extend to the south very well. This is just a shot of where construction's at today in Raymore Commerce Center. The building in the foreground is the million square foot building. Uh, so it's all up, uh, the deck is all on and there's about 
uh, in that little white square in the corner, that's 180,000 square feet of roof that's on um, uh, at the time this picture was taken. And in the background, you can see Raymore Commerce Center 1 highlighted in orange, and then the pad site in blue is Raymore Commerce Center Building 2, which will be 400, 498,000 square feet. Uh, and we've got, we just recently pulled permits on that, that project. Go ahead. Uh, so where the site uh, sits, Raymore Commerce Center South is outlined in red. Uh, so the buildings, the orange, blue, and green buildings are the Raymore Commerce Center uh, development that we've been talking about. And so just to the south, or to the right in this picture, is, is the property that uh, is uh, under consideration tonight. And so if we lay out the buildings, just, and I'll get more into the layout of the buildings as I go along here, but just this slide just kind of shows you the scale and the repetition of, of what we're contemplating. Um, I also want to point out in the lower left corner, there's a, a dash circle around the interchange at Cass Parkway and Interstate 49. This is a really important node for this development. Um, we've got great frontage on Interstate 49, so good visibility, but that access is really critical. Um, our, our users uh, want direct access to the interstate. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll see how we propose to achieve that. Uh, presently, Dean Avenue uh, extends off of Cass Parkway and terminates uh, just out along Building 3, the green building, in a cul-de-sac. Uh, we propose to work with the City of Raymore staff to extend uh, Dean Avenue through uh, to the south and connect up with 195th Street. Um, and then off of 195th Street, we would propose to ex extend a uh, city street that would terminate in a cul-de-sac in the proposed development. So trucks would come in and out uh, following this yellow line, direct access to following up Dean Avenue to the traffic signal that's coming at D Cass Parkway and Dean Avenue so that those can then safely make a maneuver onto Cass Parkway and then they're at the interchange. I want to emphasize, trucks do not want to drive through cul-de-sacs. They don't want to go into neighborhoods. They want to get straight to the interstate. And so this, this layout that we've been working on, uh, we feel gives, gives them that direct access to the interstate and keeps them out of uh, other, other public areas. All right, so uh, to talk, to, before I get into how the buildings were laid out, there's a number of forces that are uh, acting on this site that our design team, Olson engineers, uh, had to respond to. The first uh, that I want to point out is the yellow line that kind of bisects the site just, on the, just to the right of the center. That's a Southern Star high pressure gas transmission line. That line will not move uh, and we cannot put any significant grading above it and we certainly don't want to cut <laughs> into the grading uh, to, to, to expose it. So because of that presence, that line, that, that kind of forces um, some things uh, in our reaction. I'll show you how, how we've dealt with that. Uh, the other uh, big driver is in the black arrows uh, show the topography of the site. So where those arrows begin kind of all at one point, that's basically the crown or the high point of the site. And there's 40 feet of fall as you go away in three different directions. I think it's a little uh, less than 40, maybe 20, 25 as you go to the north of 195th, to, towards 195th Street. So there's a fair amount of grading that we have to accomplish. If you remember the buildings we showed you on the video, they're all, they're all at one level. They're flat. Uh, each floor, uh, it, it, the floors don't step within the buildings. So big pancake sites that have to be graded. Uh, Olson did a good job of tiering these buildings on this property so we can grade it efficiently and stay out of uh, bedrock as much as possible. The more bedrock we get into, the, obviously, the less efficient things become. Uh, there's also sanitary sewer that runs along Interstate 49 uh, from a pump station due, due at the very south end of our property. Uh, and at the, also at the very south end is a creek. Uh, so that creek is, not surprisingly, floodplain. So we won't be building anything in that creek or in that wooded area that surrounds the creek. Um, it actually creates a nice opportunity for a good landscape buffer to properties to the south. You also notice red overhead lines. Uh, those are uh, Evergy transmission lines. So we can't build buildings underneath those transmission lines. Uh, we can put parking underneath them, uh, provided we meet certain criteria as relates to clearance to the bottom of the lines and that sort of thing. Uh, finally, one of the other forces on this property is uh, the west, or excuse me, yeah, the east property line, uh, which is a heavily wooded property line. 
Uh, there's also some underground water and the power that services the pump station runs along our side of that property line. Finally, 195th Street to the north uh, is, is our access point. Um, and uh, there are some shoulder improvements, I think, that are gonna be needed for that. But other than that, the, the road is in great shape and uh, can support the truck traffic we're proposing. So here's the site plan. Uh, we are contemplating five buildings, generally as part of the PUD, uh, which add up to a, just over three million square feet uh, of proposed development. You remember the Southern Star gas pipeline? Uh, so that's right where we're putting our, what we call Commerce Drive. Uh, which is the, pr the public street that would uh, provide access into the site to some of the buildings that are further south into the site. Uh, so that, since grade won't be changing along the, the pipeline, made good sense to, to make the road follow that and take advantage of that, that force. Uh, you'll also notice in purple or maybe blue on this drawing, there's uh, five detention basins that are contemplated uh, for, the, for the development. So. Uh, uh, we will obviously comply with all uh, good standards and good engineering practices to minimize any, uh, certainly re reduce the amount of uh, uh, storm drainage that leaves our property um, through these detention basins. So here's kind of an aerial view, uh, a rendering. You can zoom out maybe a little more. Is that as far as it goes? Okay. Um, if you can maybe can you slide it up. There we go. Uh, so this um, aerial rendering, show, I like it because it depicts accurately, uh, of course no one will ever look at the buildings this way unless you're in a hot air balloon, but it does depict the distance from 195th Street. So we're looking south in this image and 195th Street is running right along there where his arrow is showing. And so uh, the buildings range from 300 to just over 400 feet from the street to the building. So. 400 feet, that, that's more than a football field away. Um, they're tall buildings, they're big. I'm not gonna pretend like you're not gonna see them, but the, we, uh, the engineers did a good job of recognizing what 95th Street, 195th Street is and, and giving some setback and some relief. Um, our next slide, I think, is, pre presents a section, or like a building section, or a section we drew through, uh, through from the street, yeah, to the buildings. Um, so the, the sections show uh, landscaping and some trees, some plantings we'll have, uh, in some cases berming, um, to try to elevate those plantings. They're shown at both the, the small tree, uh, like at the bottom of the trunk would be at the size of the tree when it's planted, and then the large tree would be at maturity many years later. Um, but to give you that idea, um, we're lining up quite a number of trees along 195th. Um, we're not gonna screen the, the buildings, perfectly, but it creates a nice buffer. And if you imagine you're driving down the 195th, if there's a colonnade of trees, it's kind of hard to see, you know, get, get your angle through there. But we want our buildings to be seen, and the top of the buildings will be visible, because signage needs to be visible. We want our truck drivers to know where they're going uh, and to go directly to that spot and not wander around through neighborhoods or get lost. Uh, and so then finally, I've got a site aerial that just kind of overlays again that the, that building layout on top of uh, an aerial view um, showing again proximity to Interstate 49, which is great visibility for the project. And so that concludes uh, the, the uh, formal presentation part and I believe uh, staff then has a report to give as well. And we'll stick around uh, with, as well as the, our engineer from Olson, we'll stick around for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, any members of the commission have any immediate questions for the applicant before we move into our staff report? Very good. Staff, please. Thank you, sir. Good evening, uh, Chairman and members of the uh, Planning Commission. I appreciate our applicants' uh, presentation. Uh, they did a very good job. Um, tonight, uh, you have in front of you a request uh, for a rezoning of reclassification um, from business park to planning unit development. Generally, uh, the site is generally located south of 195th Street and east of I-49. As this, uh, let's see, the general, um, Growth management plan identifies this property as a, uh, appropriate for biz, uh, business park. Uh, major street plan identifies 195th Street and Dean Avenue as being classified as a minor arterial roadway. And uh, as this is a public hearing tonight, this was advertised in the uh, Raymore Journal on April 28th. And then I have uh, several items of exhibit to enter into record. 
Uh, exhibit one is mailed notices to adjoining property no uh, owners. Exhibit two, notice of publication. Exhibit three, unified development code. Exhibit four, application. Exhibit five, growth management plan. Exhibit six, staff report. Exhibit seven, preliminary development plan. Exhibit eight, MOU draft. And then there's also an, exhi an additional exhibit that I placed on your all's uh, desk. Uh, there was an email that was sent in late and so that, that is the additional exhibit. Wanted to give some, uh, at least context to the history of this property as it's definitely seen um, a lot of change. It originated in 1994 as a master plan. There was an MOU and master land use plan that was uh, approved uh, in 1994 and the subject property was annexed into the city at the same time as the MOU and land use plan were approved. Uh, subject property that we're identifying as uh, tracks 22, 23, and 24 of the Good Ranch. Track 22 was originally identified as CM, Commercial Manufacturing Zoning, uh, while tracks 22 and 23 were identified as single family. Um, the property owner at the time in, in, in 2010 uh, amended the plan and changed the designation of tracks 22, 23, and 24 as business park. And then the property was rezoned as uh, from agriculture to business park in 2011. Um, proceeding a little bit further, in October of 2013, the current property owner submitted a request to obtain a conditional use permit to allow for warehousing and distribution for the entirety of the 260 acre site. The application included a proposed site plan that showed 29 individual lots uh, that would have been developed in the future. And that'll be shown as an exhibit below that. Um, also in two, uh, 2013, the Planning Commission voted 7-1 to deny the request for CUP, uh, for a conditional use permit on this property. The main reasoning behind the request uh, was that it allowed for a blanket CUP over all 29 individual lots. And so um, at that time was opposed and the applicant withdrew the request at the time. You'll also see that a good neighbor meeting was held on April the 27th and four residents attended the meeting, uh, including city, city staff and representatives from Olson Associates and Van Trust Real Estate. You'll notice all the questions and answers uh, below. Uh, some of the things to highlight, uh, Business Park District is intended for an, uh, to accommodate office, research and development, limited service, manufacturing and warehousing uses as located within a campus-like setting. And site design uh, would include larger setbacks and increased landscape buffering from a non-related uses and public rights of way. Some of the things that you'll see differently uh, will be for parking. Um, number four, you're gonna just see the, what our current standards are for parking, but then the developer has proposed a parking ratio of a one to 2,500 square feet. And this allows for essentially, uh, tenants would have specific parking requirements in the future. And so right now a tenant is not selected for these. Um, obviously with the original Rainwater Commerce Center, those tents kind of came at a later date, and so to tie them down to a specific uh, parking standard at this time uh, doesn't seem fit for this application. And so then you'll also see uh, permitted and conditional uses uh, as identified within the PUD. And one of the biggest changes that you're gonna see is that warehousing and wholesaling is permitted as opposed to a conditional use, um, while as business park zoning uh, would just be conditional use. The reclassification, reclassification of zoning to PUD requires a memorandum of understanding, uh, which is outlined in your packet. The principal purpose of the reclassification of zoning is to allow the applicant for flexibility in the development of the site, and the proposed MEU would allow city staff flexibility in approving amendments uh, as, they, as they come forward, but still will need to meet uh, the city code. Northcast Parkway and Dean have all been designed and constructed to handle the traffic generated by the development. Um, the developer is also proposing an extension of Dean Avenue uh, from its current terminus uh, south to connect to 195th. And the reclass, uh, request to reclassify the zoning of the property um, includes a requirement of a preliminary plan which was submitted. Um, its rezoning is approved. If the rezoning is approved, the preliminary plan is also approved and serves as a preliminary plat for the development. And next steps would be uh, the applicant can proceed with a final plat plan, uh, application. Um, one thing you'll notice is under the current BP zoning is that the applicant could in fact build these same buildings but just have a, a metal uh, facade to it or siding. Uh, meanwhile, this is being proposed as the concrete uh, tilt wall. The 
The subject property is an ideal location for the development of the business park and has been planned as such. As part of the Good Ranch MOU and land use plan, the proximity of I-49 provides excellent visibility to the property as well as proximity to North Cass Parkway interchange. The proposed Dean Avenue extension will provide the connection from 195th to North Cass Parkway and provide an adequate logical access and circulation to the property with necessary improvements being made uh, to the transportation utility network. City staff recommends uh, to the Planning and Zoning Commission they accept staff proposed findings of fact in forward case 22012 reclassification of zoning of 262.09 acres located south of 195th and east of I-49 from business park to PUD uh, to the city council with recommendation of approval. This concludes staff report. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> do any members of the commission, before we get into the public hearing aspect, um, have any immediate questions for staff? Got a quick question uh, regarding the concrete tilt wall. You said that's the only thing that's requiring them to get a PUD rather than building with the BP. So, uh, Commissioner Manzer, uh, that is one of the, uh, of the examples, but that was one that stuck out as, as far as that's concerned. So if they were to proceed with the, the current zoning of BP, they could in fact do that and, and nothing to tie them to, to having to do the concrete tilt wall. Okay. To elaborate on that a little bit, the UDC, uh, and I think I pointed out a section 440 of the Unified Development Code, um, that section provides the minimum standards for building design uh, for any building in the city of Raymore and an industrial zone district which business park would fall under that classification. The use of metal siding is permitted where in other zoning districts commercially it is not. Um, stucco and brick, um, stone, those are the requirements and there are certain percentages in commercial zone districts but in an industrially zoned district which would be classified as also business park, the use of metal would be permitted. Um, as Dylan mentioned, the MOU requires the submittal of a preliminary plan and with that were elevations. So if, if the rezoning is approved tonight, that preliminary plan serves as the site plan, the preliminary plat, but also the developer then is tied to what those buildings look like being the concrete tilt wall. Um, that, that is one of the major differences in the PUD, but not the only difference okay. in the PUD. Gotcha, yep, that was the way I understood the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Any immediate questions before we move into the public hearing? Very good. Well, as I opened the public hearing earlier, um, I will invite any members of the public to please come and speak um, regarding this case up here to the podium. Uh, please turn on the microphone. There's a little button that says push to make sure the green light is on. Uh, we do ask that you keep your comments to five minutes. Um, please state your name and your address for the record. And if you happen to have the same comments that somebody else has already um, given us, just kind of just um, say I have the same comments as uh, to prevent, you know, using your five minutes, basically saying the exact same thing. Um, but if any members of the public wish to come forward to speak, we welcome you to do so at this time, please. Kerry <laughs> uh, King, 909 Doe Drive. I'm just to the east of where somebody wants to build a million square foot building uh, destroys my possibly destroys my property value in a major way. Um, schools right down the street. Oh, well, I got a big question about you got a million square foot building and it has a fire. Is our fire department prepared for that? And they're at that million square foot building and I've got a fire. Then what? I mean, that's a big building. That's monster. Uh, I just, yeah, I just want to be left alone. <laughs> I, a bedroom community is what I, I moved to, and that was Raymore. That's why I moved here, as a bedroom community. I love it. But uh, big square footage is not for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Scott Von Baron, 917 Doe Drive. Um, kind of the same same sentiment uh, as Mr. King, but you know, when we moved to Raymore a couple years ago, we'd lived in Belton for 15 years, and uh, you know, we got set up with uh, with utilities and with trash and all that, and it didn't hit me at the time, but on the side of the trash can it says, "Come home to more," 
we don't need more big buildings. We need more housing. I mean, obviously we know there's a housing shortage, but the thing that was interesting in the in the description, and I get it, I've, I've dealt with these things before, so I know there's uh, um, a need for some things like this um, across the metro, but uh, what it didn't talk about was you know, we're 195th, there's gonna be truck traffic. And just like Mr. King said, there's also school bus traffic. There's a school right down the road. There's housing, and I'm quite sure that there will be more housing out there uh, farther down the road. And, uh, you know, like I say, I get that there's a need for some, some things like this, but I don't know how many more big buildings we need right along 49, especially when it's encroaching on uh, residential area. So thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, I'm Zubin Talib, 19126 South Ranch Road, Belton, Missouri. Um, I want to start by thanking both Dylan and David for speaking to me this afternoon on the phone. They gave me a lot of answers to some of the questions I had. It was very useful. But I thought I'd like to reiterate some of that over here for the benefit of everybody. Um, the first question I have has to do with the classification and the need to rezone. I just want, in simple language, what is the benefit of the PUD reclassification, uh, A, to the developer, B, to the residents in Raymore, and then finally, obviously, to the city, if there is any. My second question relates to green space, and uh, I think the gentleman from the development uh, mentioned something about putting some trees up and it would take a certain amount of time before the trees got tall enough to hide the building, but between now and then, what happens to us? Uh, I happen to live directly across the place where they're going to be putting these buildings up. Uh, right now, I can look out in the morning and I see horses in the field. Uh, when this happens, I'm going to see a giant concrete slab, perhaps tastefully painted, but uh, it doesn't really soothe the soul. Um, the third question I have is about also traffic like the other uh, residents have talked about. 195th Street, we do have a school, we have residences uh, further east, and we have the fire department over there as well. Um, I'm curious as to how this will all be managed with semi-trucks and, uh, you know, I assume dump trucks and other kinds of heavy industrial trucks moving up and down this road. We have a school there, pick up and drop off times. How is that all gonna be impacted? As the school grows or as the school district grows, what are the plans for making these two different types of activity, living and schooling and warehousing, more compatible? Um, and then finally, uh, the gentleman from uh, the developer also mentioned something about signage and uh, wanting the truckers to be able to see the signs and know where they're going. Certainly important, better they turn into the right place than our house, but uh, I'd like to understand more uh, what are these signs? Are they going to be brightly lit? Are they going to be neon? Are they going to be several, you know, how big are they going to be? Will they be on all night? Um, I think there's a lot of questions here. Um, maybe some of them are more relevant at a different time, but I did want to raise them. Um, you know, there's a whole lot more questions about these sorts of activities and, and, and so on. And that's, those are the questions that I had. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Good evening, mm -hmm. Gary Stuff, 918 Kodiak Street, again in uh, Whitetail mm -hmm. Run. And I just have a question about the uh, Dean Avenue extension. When that thing actually gets into 195th Street, there is a small portion of 195th Street that comes off a of peculiar drive. How is that intersection going to be addressed? Is Dean going to have the, the right of way and it's going to be a stop sign at uh, 195th Street? It's going to be a roundabout. Is it, oh, it can't be a roundabout, I guess, for the big trucks. Uh, that's the big thing. The second thing is, is it's noted that uh, 195th Street is considered a minor arterial roadway. However, we do have the uh, fire department right there that uses that as their prime ingress and egress route to everything west of their firehouse. So it is a pretty important piece of road. And if we have a, a plethora of trucks and buildings going on there, it might impact it. That's all I had to say. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Good 
Good evening. I'm Jane Redmond, 1806 Archer Drive. I will actually look off of my back deck and see the real beautiful buildings that you're planning to build. Um, so we talked about traffic and it's been, a, it's been talked about before, but I actually go to work eight o'clock in the morning. That drop off and pick up into the school, if I'm not out of my driveway, oh, can you not hear me? Oh. So if I'm not out of my driveway by a certain time, those buses and that traffic is a madhouse. I mean, I try to get to my office at like 7.45. With the trucks, I just wanna know how we are gonna address that. And what's gonna stop the trucks from actually coming down 195th? I get that they're, they're making the route through Dean, but if it's not convenient, are they gonna take 195th? These are elementary children at the school. So I just, I just want us to take that into account. Plus, I'm giving up my beautiful view off of my, my deck that I moved there for, from Blue Springs, Missouri. So, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Zach Trujillo, 911 Coyote Drive, Raymore. Uh, I live in the community uh, as well as some of the other members. I guess kind of reiterate a few things were said, but maybe a little more detail um, around, it was mentioned the quick access from the interstate, which I understand that that's an important aspect of this to have that um, easy access route off of 49. However, with the extension that's planned onto 195th, I think it's probably close to two miles access to, to the doorstep of those buildings. Um, so I'm interested to see how far that is. Um, something that was brought up earlier around how we would create an intersection there. That is a very, um, as it was mentioned, it was a, a minor um, roadway through uh, 195th that is. So there's a steep drop off there. There have to be some significant improvements made to the infrastructure of that road just to handle that type of traffic. Not only in that small area of 195th that this um, development would be utilizing, but to the east as well. So I guess, that's another concern is would there be anything in place to help keep that traffic or to keep trucks from going east on 195th? Um, additionally, there at the corner of 195th and um, School Road, there's just a stop sign. That is a major um, roadway for school traffic in the morning, which I imagine you're gonna have shift changes in the morning, you're gonna have trucks coming in and out in the morning. There's nothing that's really gonna stop them from getting to that intersection. There's just a stop sign there. And if you ever try to turn left um, on that on the school road, you're looking at maybe waiting five, 10 minutes just to make a left turn. So if we get the additional tra um, traffic, I don't think that the infrastructure around that area is gonna be able to handle that at all. So we're gonna be looking at making a, a lot of improvements just to that area, just to handle this one little short area of road to have trucks come into this facility, not to mention the other, um, displeasing aesthetic portions of this. I mean, I moved out to this area to get away from things like that. I enjoy my morning drive um, and looking in that field, seeing the horses and the coyotes. Um, I live on Coyote Drive, so um, yeah, I enjoy that. And I don't wanna look at these large buildings. Um, the other thing is too, I, th I think we built a lot of these in, or a lot of these have been built in Belton in Raymore. And so I'm interested as to how many of those have actually filled um, the, the uh, contracts for those it seems like there's still some empty space to be contracted out of those buildings so what is the plan to have those actually filled with tenants after building um, because of a lot of the ones that we have built now I see there's still empty tenant space there so I think that's something to consider as well and building another million square feet so thank you thank you sir Podium is still open if anybody else has any more comments to add. Okay, well, I will go ahead. Oh, yes, sir, please. Sorry, it's, it's not a comment, it's just a question. Do we have an idea or an anticipation, an anticipated number of vehicles that will be coming as a result of this? Additional vehicles like the, park, the, the vehicles that are gonna take the parking as well as how many semis, trucks, all of this sort of stuff, that would also be useful to know. 
Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yes, ma'am, please. My name's Mary Stupp. I live at 918 Kodiak. I sold the house to my husband and I in 2009, and we moved there because it was country. We moved there because it was low populated. We moved there because there was horses down the street and the, the farm, the 100-year farm, and we enjoy all that. We don't want it destroyed with big mega buildings coming in and destroying our countryside. We have animals, we have children, we have a school, we have a fire department, and the firemen are gonna get held up with traffic. I don't agree with this at all. I'm totally against it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir, please. I need to state my name again. Uh, Kerry, yeah, King, just Kerry King, 909 Doe Drive. Yes, sir. Do you guys have an idea on how much this is gonna cost the city? I mean, you, I, are, are they getting a tax break or what? You know, they come in and then our property value or property taxes are high enough as it is. And then we go in and we have to pay for somebody moving in that is an eyesore in my mind. Uh, how much is this gonna cost? You, you got to beef up, like I said, everybody's talking fire department. And sure. Infrastructure is just not there for it. It's a good question. Any we'll, ideas? We will ask for it. We will see I if mean, we can get some information, sir. Hmm? I, I don't have that information. This is part of the I mean, I don't know if you've gotten so. that far along or not. Uh, hopefully, everybody does have an idea on how much it's going to cost before we go sure. yes. Well, so, that, that would be more city council than it would be the planning and zoning, okay. sir. We, we okay. just, while we, we are focused on is, is what the proposed project, does it fit what the property is zoned for? Yeah. That's all we look at, cost okay. and stuff, that goes to council. I usually know how much I'm gonna spend at the grocery store before I go. <laughs> Just saying, thank you. For thank you, time. sir, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, I will leave the, the uh, public hearing open for the time being um, to give either city or the applicant an opportunity to uh, address some of the questions and concerns that have been presented, if they have anything to state um, to add to um, any of the, the comments that we just heard? So I don't know if the applicant or the city would like to address anything, please. I think all the staff will start with a couple of the ones that are relevant to, uh, for us to answer, and then I will actually pass it to the applicant for a couple of the other ones that are more specific to their team. Um, and I'll kind of just run down the list of things that I highlighted to answer here. Um, the, the first one, the big issue is traffic. Um, and so as part of this, uh, obviously Dean Avenue would be extended if this is approved. Um, and with regards to the intersection of the 195th Street connection over to the outer road in Belton, um, the applicant has completed a, an alignment study and staff has reviewed that and determined generally what, the, what that intersection will look like. Um, in essence, if this road is extended, Dean Avenue South would be the priority road for lack of a better term. So 195th Street would then tee into that. It would be reconstructed to be more of a, a T intersection. Um, and then there would be a stop sign at that road. So 195th Street heading east would stop and then enter onto Dean Avenue when they had a chance when traffic clears. So uh, like I said, that has been generally conceptually designed by the applicant and their design team staff has reviewed that um, and is generally supportive of the final design of that roadway which would be completed as if this rezoning does go forward. Um, with regards to fire, um, so the fire department, the fire marshal does sit in on all of our pre-application meetings so they're aware of this project. Um, they've indicated they have the equipment to serve it and that the support is there to serve this development and um, others through the, the fire station that is right next door, um, in addition to the other residential growth that is um, that will come at some point here in the future. Um, the other question relative to traffic was signage, and so we, we staff does not anticipate, nor would they support lit signage in terms of traffic. Um, we would, you know, that would be something we couldn't really mitigate if that were to be lighted onto those properties, and so it would be traditionally just a standard metal road sign that a, a truck would see. Um, the more likely than not, we would restrict truck traffic from heading east out of the development. Um, we've also kind of talked conceptually about um, beyond the signage, how can we restrict traffic from turning right out of the development and heading east, and whether that's through the design of the actual curb drive, um, the radius of that curb to make it um, uncomfortable for a road to, or for a truck to turn right out of that development and almost force them to turn left and head back up to Dean Avenue. Like I said, that's the, that's the intention of extending Dean Avenue is that that becomes their priority. 
Um, the, uh, the question did come up relative to employees in traffic, um, and those individuals would be driving passenger vehicles like any other person would, and so there would not be any restrictions necessarily for those types of vehicles coming out of the development. Um, but unless they live really in, on the east side of Raymore or south end of Cass County, the majority of those folks would probably head up to Dean Avenue um, via the extension in North Cass Parkway and use the interchange. Um, relative to, to the fire district and the school, they are you know, sub generally supportive of that road being extended because it provides a much better, safer connection up to that part of Raymore as opposed to turning left onto School Road, which um, can be a dangerous intersection um, during the day. Um, the, uh, the other question was the improvements to 195th Street. Um, so there will be some shoulder improvements to widen that, some turn lanes that would then get into the development to restrict traffic from backing up too much. Um, as part of that, um, that would be something that the developer would be paying for um, as part of this development. Um, the, uh, additionally, as part of that, you know, the, the subdivisions and the undeveloped areas around that are, a lot of that is zoned for future residential growth. And so the intent is that as those subdivisions built out, you know, we're not just extending Dean Avenue to serve just this development, but it would be as those other, the, the remainder of Whitetail Run, you know, when that develops or the other subdivisions that are proposed as part of the Good Ranch, um, as those develop, the intention would be that those residents would then use the extension of Dean to get further north directly to the interchange and in and out of Raymore, as opposed to heading east on some of those county roads that um, aren't terribly safe um, with, with that amount of traffic. Um, so I think that, you know, relative to some of the questions that were asked, I think I, think I answered all the ones that the city would be, um, you know, responsible for. I'll pass it to the applicant. The, I know the question was asked on generally how many trucks would come out of this. Um, so I'll let the applicant speak to some of the numbers that they've run. Um, they did submit a kind of a traffic analysis. Um, what I would point out is that with these buildings more often than not, what's proposed is the shell of the building. We don't generally know who the tenant is. And so anything beyond knowing who that tenant is is, is kind of just our, our best guess. Um, but I will let the applicant speak to some of the projects maybe they've worked on where they can give maybe more specific numbers to that. Thank you, sir. Do you all have any comments or addition? Yeah, I'll turn it over to Brett Lawrenson with Olson Engineers to address the traffic count question. Uh, Brett Lawrenson uh, with Olson, 7301 West 133rd Street, Overland Park. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Members of the commission and staff, thank you. Um, yeah, I was taking some notes and um, happy to answer questions on traffic. I'd like to provide a quick um, one minute overview of how traffic studies are conducted first and then get into the indiv individual questions. Before yeah. you get started, can you put back up the part of the video where it shows us what the Dean extension is supposed to look like hitting the 195th? Because what we got in our packet doesn't really kind of show us that new design. And conceptually, while I re recall, I'd like to, to, I'm a visual person, if you would please. And while we pull it up, um, give a, a brief uh, kind of overview. Um, yes, the traffic study was completed for the development and it considered everything at full build, meaning the entire entirety of the project built out as, as shown. Um, as, as engineers, we have guidelines that we have to follow and in the traffic world, it's the ITE which gives us guidance on uh, calculations, on distribution, uh, and also guides how traffic is evaluated. And it's pretty standard across the United States, uh, regardless if we're in Miami, Florida, or right here in Raymore. Um, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a standard that uh, traffic engineers use for, for determining these kind of, uh, looking at these developments. Um, as well as determining the busiest hours and uh, comparing those against local regulations and requirements uh, in this case. So uh, regarding specific questions, there were several regarding uh, school. And schools are very interesting in that school drop-off and pickup times actually fall outside of busiest hours of business operation, uh, meaning the peaks or the busiest periods 
often are staggered, which is actually helps the roadway network. Um, there's several questions about um, the number of vehicles, uh, and in the traffic study, the expected trip generation during the busiest hour, which is what we study, is 500 total vehicles, 100 which of our trucks, 400 vehicles. These will have a lot more, there'll be a lot more employees, um, and these are based on studies conducted across the United States. Uh, so again, that was 500 in the busiest hour. Um, let's see, there were several questions about the intersection and continuation of Dean um, at a preliminary level, and Mr. Grass was absolutely correct. Um, We've, we've looked at that in terms of safety, design criteria, and uh, we believe a T intersection makes the most sense at this time. Uh, but again, that, that design is uh, in, incredibly, incredibly conceptual right now. Yes. Hey, while we're talking about that, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that's conceptual in nature. As, um, as we're looking at the map right here, I noticed that when Dean Avenue extension comes into 195th Street, there's an awful lot of 195th Street that is used for truck traffic. Is there, is there not another conception? I know you're trying to maximize the green space for the use of the buildings. That would make that a four-way, though, so that, it, that the truck traffic actually enters the park at, a, at the westernmost uh, corner of that property rather than putting all that truck traffic on several hundred yards of 195th Street. Um, can, can we go to maybe a, zoom, a little bit more zoomed in on the site plan if possible? I think, I, and I think I'm following your question here. Or, yeah, there. Uh, yes, so if I'm understanding correctly, bring the de bringing Dean further west so that it makes a, a four-way intersection? No, bring, bring, yeah, so if you're bringing Dean into 195th Street where you're bringing it into, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why can't that be the entrance to the commercial park for truck traffic purposes rather than using so much of 195th Street? So can you extend Dean Street south? Oh, pull, the bring the, bring Just the take it right or straight across 195th Street. Um, I, I think part of the concern is the truck yeah. traffic mixture with bus traffic, uh, regular auto traffic on 195th Street for as long a period of time as they're going to be on 195th. And I don't know if that interferes with the layout of the buildings that you have designed on the property there, but it would seem to me that that might be a better way to, for entrance and egress to the commercial park uh, and would uh, minimize actually the truck drivers having to be on 195th Street because they could take their trucks straight across the Dean Avenue extension and 195th Street remains more or less a secondary uh, roadway that it is today rather than turning it into a, a primary for truck traffic. You see what I'm saying? Yes, now I do. Um, there, certainly, I uh, think that there's room to explore that. Two, two concerns out of the gate and, and looking through and remembering some of the details. Th there, there's some topography challenge in that corner. And that was my other question, is there, are there topography issues that prevent that? There is, and, and you, you run into kind of the rub of topography and design standards. You can only put roads so steep, you can only bring them up so quick. Um, so th that's certainly one. That also creates 195th for a lot of uh, folks have mentioned um, using that road to get, to come over and um, work east-west. That would create a stop movement for them in that scenario, most likely. Well, it likely would, I, I agree. Okay. It, it likely would create a stop movement. I, I don't think that's such a bad thing. Coming from 40 years of police work, I don't think that's yeah. such a bad thing. Yeah. I know Mike might disagree with me because he's the engineer, but <laughs> <laughs> we've disagreed before on stuff. Yeah. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Other questions? I think there might be another question on that. Is, uh, did you have something? Oh, no, I mean, you kind of hit on what I was talking. I was just, I just wanted to see that connection again. And then to his point, you know, as you're going east west on 195th, what that looked like, um, just so that I could get a better understanding of how we we're trying to connect it there, um, just from a, a traffic flow standpoint. So that definitely helped let me see it visually. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.
and I apologize. I think I might have interfered with you were you were getting ready to say something else. I'd have to dig in the memory bank. Nope. <laughs> okay. You were talking about big, normal right. traffic flows, 400 cars, 100 semis, in and out. I mean, I can see the folks' yeah. concern about truck traffic up and down. We still have J Highway, and you still got 291, and I can see some truck driver getting confused about getting off of 49 there and coming in from the east and or, or coming from the east going west and, and getting – using a gps that takes him down 195th street most of the way and i i'm i'm concerned that that roadway with the school and the fire department there and the homes uh, that that truck tra traffic would be uh interfering uh with them and i i kind of watched uh, and i'm not trying to get on my soapbox here but i've i've watched the traffic over at the north point facility which is pretty well built out and has a similar uh, traffic concerns previously about trucks and neighborhood traffic uh, getting involved with one another. And it hasn't really come to fruition. The, the traffic flow over there has actually been pretty good, pretty good. and there haven't been uh, very many problems in that commercial park. And I, I suspect that if there are similar vendors uh, that we have that are looking at this commercial park, that, that we might actually see that kind of of use going on there as well. I will state nothing has scared me more on Kelly Road than when a semi decided to go down 155th up to Kelly Road to 150. Oh yeah, I've had driving that down to Kelly, which is too. about three feet wider on, than the truck. And on Horridge Road and on yeah. Kelly Road, and yeah, that, that is a concern. And then that that did remind me of the question you were talking about the traffic flow times, mm -hmm. uh, and you said it's usually not an issue. What is the normal traffic flow time? Uh, just so that we're kind of, you know, I'm assuming, just thinking to myself, and I don't want to assume, but normally it's like a 6 p 6 a.m., 6 p.m. kind of shift change, which is before school and then 6 p.m. after school. But is that the case or what, when you say that they don't really hit, what is mm -hmm. the kind of the normal shift change times? Uh, great question. They, it varies by location, and so we counted this, and uh, the afternoon or the, the busiest time is 5 to 6 p.m., yep, so definitely after school. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did, yeah we did counts in the area. Yep. Is that for both cars and trucks? Y yes. That time mm -hmm. period. Yep. Okay. It's based on uh, current data as of about two months ago. I had one quick question. So you mentioned the you know peak hour that you're studying the most. I mm -hmm. guess what is the the opposite of the peak hour, the valley hour, where you know, it'll be the lightest vehicle load. Do you have any idea how much this will produce in its lightest hour? No, we actually don't study that. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, the night, these, but these buildings yeah. are probably zero. 24 hours, right? Say, yep. So mm -hmm. you're going to have employees and you're going to have trucks coming in and out through all other hours of the night, potentially. So I, the trucks probably. Th that really varies on, on tenant and tip. I mean, so that that's, yeah, impossible to predict. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, if sir. I could address, close the just the or not close the comments, but address kind of maybe in summary the comments on the extension of uh, of Dean Avenue and 195th. I the and I copied a snippet of this plan in your all's packet. What what I have here is the original. Um, Good Ranch MOU and land use plan that was approved in 94. And it's been amended a couple of times over the last several of years. But, um, you know, what you see generally, this is the document the staff looks at when we review projects at, on any property in the Good Ranch to determine is it consistent with what was originally approved. And I wanted to point out, um, you can't really see it from here, but the black lines on this map show generally the major roads that would be developed at some point through the entirety of the Good Ranch and that 1,700 acres. Um, it, it was always proposed at one point that Dean Avenue would connect to 195th. There were, there's been two iterations of that. Um, one would have been from its kind of its current terminus right now. Actually, it would have gone further to the east, right down the center of what is Ranch Road right now is the entrance into the Good Otis, or I'm sorry, the Good Owen Good Ranch. Um, we know that that property owner lives there still, and they probably will for the foreseeable future. And so that that connection is no longer a reality for the city or or the developer or the property owner. Um, and so the second 
option for that or option that was contemplated was generally the alignment that we're, that we're seeing here tonight, um, where, it, where it generally hugs the interstate um, as close as it can to the west. Um, and wraps around and intersects with 195th Street. And I always say that, um, you know, I've mentioned this to a couple folks, um, the majority of what has developed in the Good Ranch, both residentially, um, industrially at this point, um, has developed really very similar to exactly how it was approved back in 1994. Um, and I only say that um, just to support, you know, a staff's original comment that this development has always been contemplated and planned as part of that. The traffic, um, you know, Dean Avenue, where it's currently built, was designed to accommodate the existing traffic that would come out of that development and the further extension to the south. Um, and so those are things that staff has looked at uh, conceptually as part of the road design. Um, it hasn't been finally engineered yet, um, but I just wanted to make it part of the record that as part of the rezoning, staff has looked at that um, and considered what those impacts might be. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Zer, do you think we have addressed the as many of the public, well, I guess you wouldn't necessarily know entirely, but um, from a public hearing perspective, uh, so we can move into uh, commission member discussion, um, would that be appropriate or? or you are the chair <laughs> and control the amount of public input allowed during the course of this public hearing. I believe you've heard from everyone in the room within the group and some of them on a couple of occasions. I don't know if you have any more questions that staff would be appropriate for providing input on, whether that be legal engineering or staff. Um, happy to provide any additional input you might have, but uh, you have heard from the public. It may be helpful just to explain the nature of of the PUD request and why that request is here this evening and not the existing zoning district and kind of what, what the differences might be. Um, I think that was a major question that staff received is, you know, we're saying that this development is allowed, so why does the rezoning have to occur or why is it occurring? Um, and and I'll, I'll point out that this is a very similar process um, to what was done for Raymer Commerce Center 1. Um, that property was also zoned business park and it was rezoned to PUD, um, very similar to what we're here to discuss this evening, but the, the major points in that um, is that um, it provides, uh, if the rezoning request is approved, um, what the developer is showing on their plan is five buildings uh, of varying sizes. Um, if the rezoning is approved, that becomes the approved site plan for the project, and the PUD affords the flexibility for staff um, when, when Van Trust and even city staff are responding to tenants that want to find a building in, in Kansas City or in Raymore specifically, um, each of those have a very specific set of criteria they look for, whether it's the size of the building, the number of parking spaces, um, sometimes the orientation of the building is important. Um, and so the PUD allows the flexibility to establish what the, the, the boundaries are for the project in terms of square footage, generally the number of buildings. Um, if you think back to Raymore Commerce Center 1, the site plan originally was approved as four individual buildings. Um, at a set square footage, more or less. Um, because of the market conditions, Van Trust decided that it made sense to do combine two of those buildings into one. Um, they still comply with all of the standards that were approved as part of that in terms of square footage, setbacks, building appearance, et cetera. Um, but it allowed them to respond to a need they were seeing effectively without having to go through the you know, 60, 45 to 60 day process when the change was deemed um, minor because the square footage overall stayed the same. Under the current business park zoning district, each of those changes would have to come back individually through the process. Um, and, and so long as they're not substantially changed, the, you know, I, I give the example, um, this right now is just over 3 million square feet. If, if the developer were to come back and say, well, we, we'd rather do 6 million or 7 million, that, that is a substantial change that would negate this approved plan and that would come back through the process. But um, in the instance where the developer responded to a project where they needed to maybe split a building into two um, separate buildings, or again, combine one into a larger building, the, the PUD zoning affords the flexibility for staff to review that, um, evaluate it against the plan that was approved, and so long as it's not substantially different and the square footages are, as a, as a whole, majorly the same and it still meets the setbacks, um, staff can review that and, and approve it administratively uh, in-house. And there's certain, certain thresholds that require either it to come back to the commission or not. That, that's what the MOU generally lays out. Um, and I want to highlight, and maybe the, the developer can reiterate it, is the importance of that in responding to projects. When we talk about um, 
finding tenants for these. Um, usually when staff responds to a, a tenant, there's five other buildings in the Kansas City area. Um, sometimes Belton is one of those. And sometimes there's other states as well. And so what, what those developers and, and tenants are looking for is a reason to not locate in that community. And, and a huge challenge in that is the approval process. Um, you know, a developer or a tenant necessarily doesn't want to wait 60 more days to get their answer of whether or not can I go in that building. So what the PUD does is it sets those rules on the front end of the project for the commission to consider and it outlines what those expectations are. And so long as um, the, the final building plan meets those criteria, um, staff can review that and support those changes administratively. That, that flexibility is not afforded in the PUD, or I'm sorry, in the existing business park zoning district. Um, and so that, that's a critical piece that comes into play when we look at finding tenants to go in these buildings um, is that they need the, the flexibility to be able to respond to um, the, the needs of the, the changing market. Um, different companies require different size buildings, et cetera. Uh, I just, that was the major question that staff got over the last couple of weeks is, you know, we keep saying this use is allowed, which it majorly is. So why the zoning request change? Um, you know, staff feels that the PUD is the best tool to to accommodate what the developer needs, but still have enough assurances built in through the MOU and the zoning code um, to restrict it to being you know, a quality development um, as it's been proposed. So I just wanted to provide that background. It's not the, the easiest thing to try and explain to somebody, um, but certainly if there are questions, Mr. Eppard, I can answer those. Thank you, sir. Chairman, to that point, can I ask just call it a clarifying question to in a sense, dumb down what you just said for myself. Um, what they're proposing could be accomplished under the current zoning criteria, but changing it to this allows it to have the flexibility to do what they propose, but then also make it more attractive to potential buyers or less or lessees of the building. Correct. Okay. Yeah. The, Thank the, you. the development standards, everything is majorly the same. The, the difference is really the process that would go through when a tenant responds and, and wants to be in Raymore. That is what the PUD affords is that more, um, I'll say friendly process as opposed to sending each one of these individual changes back to the commission. Um, the nature of the use of the property isn't going to change. It's just, is this building going to be 300,000 square feet or will it be 400? Um, it's, it's those types of details that are addressed and accommodated by the PUD. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, well then, I will go ahead and close the public hearing uh, at 8.02. Um, and obviously we've had some commissioner, commission member questions and comments, but I will formally um, uh, request any of those comments or questions at this time from members of the commission. Mr. Faulkner. Mr. Chair, I just have a Brief question for staff uh, about a detail. So in the staff report, page 14, uh, near the top of the page, it's got an inset paragraph. If the initial final plat and so forth, and it goes on to say at the end that a subsequent final plat shall be filed every five years from date, blah, 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 or the preliminary development plan becomes null and void. And in the MOU, uh, I believe it's on page seven, at the bottom, phasing schedule makes a statement the preliminary development plat does not expire. And I don't know, to me that seems contradictory. So I would uh, reiterate that the MOU is simply in draft format still. There are still a couple items that we're working through. Um, I would I would leave that up to the commission um, to kind of make, give staff some guidance on what is more, what, what should be balanced more in that decision. Um, in a traditional final plat, uh, you know, this would act as a preliminary plat. The city code requires that a final plat is filed within one year um, of the preliminary plat being approved or that preliminary plat becomes null and void. Um, originally with Raymore Commerce Center 1, we built in the flexibility of increasing that to five years, um, just because sometimes it does take a lot of time to find a tenant or decide to move forward with the construction, and so we felt increasing that was, uh, was flexibility that we were affording that developer. Um, and so what you're seeing in the MOU, I believe, may have been just a leftover from a previous MOU for um, another project. 
Um, so staff, you know, we're open to the commission's direction and also the city council's on what, what the right direction would be. Um, should we allow the preliminary plan to, once approved, um, be approved, you know, for the life of the property? Or should there be some of those safeguards baked into that to, um, to protect that? As I mentioned in my last comment, the nature of the, the use of the property really doesn't change um, under the um, current zoning or the proposed zoning. Um, what the preliminary plat would address would just be the layout. Um, and I, I think in staff's mind with the flexibility that the PUD gives to kind of push and pull those dimensions, as I mentioned. I don't know that um, holding them to the plan necessarily through that regard is 100% um, necessary. Um, I think that the flexibility of staff provides the assurance that it will be developed in accordance with how it was proposed. But certainly if, um, if the market changes and this property does sit vacant for more than five years, um, that is something staff can consider. So I, I appreciate you catching that. Um, it was not reflected in the MOU because that is simply mm -hmm. still a draft, but can, open to the commission's thoughts. Yeah. Can I can I ask Mr. Zer's uh, opinion on that? <clears throat> you are not approving the memorandum of understanding this evening as part of your evaluation for ah. it. Um, obviously, it's a, a point that will continue to be negotiated between staff as well as the developer, the uh, applicant on this one, and would be approved by the city council ultimately in order to be able to wrinkle to smooth out whatever wrinkle and conflict there might be there. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. And uh, my my own opinion, Mr. Grass, would be I'd, I'd probably lean toward being consistent with the uh, five year on the Raymore Commerce Center to the north, but that's just my opinion. And, and as Mr. Zer said, uh, MOU is not up for Planning and Zoning Commission approval tonight. Thank you. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Rekia. Uh On the uh, information we received, normally the properties surrounding the subject property are give us, you give us what they're zoned. So the little patch of land in between the house, the house, the neighborhood, and then the subject property that's kind of right in there in between it, what is that currently zoned? So that's actually located within the county, and I believe it is currently just zoned as agricultural land. Um, there is, I believe, a if I'm correct with my geography, I believe there may be a home on that property somewhere. Um, I couldn't tell you based on the arrow, but I believe in the county it's just zoned as agricultural land. And, at this point. and that is obviously county land, but I was just curious. And then to the north of it, between the the current center that they built and this property that they're proposing, there is some kind of land in between there. What is that zoned currently? And then what is kind of the future use thought of, of that area? I believe it's uh, what you're talking about is the, it's zoned as Parks and Rec or PR, but th that's also the pump station there. So, so it's public. Well, and then to the it, east. A, a, big, a big portion of that is also agricultural. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you would superimpose the existing zoning on top of the existing land use plan, though, in the future when more residential development occurs, um, it would be rezoned to either R1 or um, some other residential zoning district upon that development. Um, but everything to the north right now, with the exception of the pump station, is, is, is zoned agricultural. I have a couple quick questions. Um, one thing that was brought up during public comments and always something I like to inquire about, um, you know, occupancy, obviously we've got our own, but do we know what general occupancy of the commercial buildings around town are? Obviously I would assume nobody would propose 3.1 million square feet if there wasn't an anticipated need, but. I know uh, just across the bridge in Belton, the buildings that they have built in the Southview Commerce Center, um, I, I believe they're wrapping up the fourth building in that, in that park. Um, I do not know specifically if there's a tenant, um, there may be, but I know the three buildings that are constructed are all occupied and have businesses within them. Um, obviously building one in the Commerce Center is occupied. Um, that company is working on the tenant improvements for that um, at the current time. Um, and then as the developer mentioned, and, and in addition to staff, there are three active projects that two that staff is pursuing and one that developer is pursuing for a tenant um, for existing building three, which is under construction. Thank you. Um, and then just from a, um, a perspective of, of what, you know, we require for different um, projects and stuff, I, I was thinking back to, um, 
you know, some tornadoes that happened, you know, within the last year or so, and um, these warehouse style buildings collapsing and stuff under, you know, heavy, um, you know, acts of God, if you will. Um, do we as a, as a city require um, any so, sort of um, security or shelter within uh, these facilities? I know that was a massive complaint that, you know, Amazon, when they build these facilities, not that this would necessarily be who the occupant would be, um, but is there anything that we do as a city to require um, an occupant or a developer to implement some sort of um, shelter, if you will? So that's really dictated by the, the use and the occupancy class of, in, of inside the building. Um, for an industrial warehouse, I don't think our building code addresses any requirements for that. Um, but I'll give an example of the, uh, the lead center, which is under construction, used to be on Old Orchlands, did not have a storm shelter. Um, but because of the change in occupancy to a, um, uh, I can't think of how it's classified, but basically an educational building, um, there are children in there now. And so that, that was a change in the plans for that building as it did require a, a uh, fairly large storm shelter to be built inside that building. I, I don't think the same would apply to a warehouse building unless it was a very specific tenant that went inside of there that had specific requirements addressed by the building code. But in general, I don't think there are any requirements for storm shelters. Any other members of the commission have any questions for staff or the developer? I do. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Zur, what what are we considering tonight other than the rezoning from, is the preliminary plat, plat part of this as well? I believe you are sim simply looking at the dis distinction between making it a change from the business park district to the PUD planned unit development district. That is the goal that you're looking at this evening. Now they have included the proposed development plan for this uh, and they are identifying the, the proposed PUD and the development plan is to provide flexibility, et cetera, et cetera. So you're t looking at that in conjunction with what you're being shown for the development plan, not the MOU though. And the, the major difference in, under the current zoning classification, if, if the developer were to pursue this project under that, the, their next step would be a final plot and a site plan two separate applications that would come forward to the commission. Um, by electing, in, in talking with staff, by electing to use the PUD, um, they generated that site plan, if you will, the preliminary plan on the front end of that. Um, and so that's, that's, when it, that's when the MOU comes into play and that's the assurance that what, what the developer is showing us to obtain the PUD zoning is in fact what will get built. And that's where the MOU becomes the binding document that that gets built. Um, I, I gave the example that, um, the hypothetical that this property is currently zoned agricultural right now, it's not, but Hypothetical. Um, if a developer were to approach the city and request the business park zoning district like they did back in 2011, I believe, um, that does not require the submittal of any plans necessarily. Staff always encourages a conceptual plan just to show what is going on. Um, but once that zoning would be achieved, as long as any development meets what the minimum standards are in the UDC for business park, um, as long as it meets those, the commission, um, I won't say they would have to, but they would have little um, authority to deny an application or site plan because it meets those minimum standards in the UDC. Um, and they could come back with any iteration of a site plan. And again, as long as it complies with those standards, it would be an approved use of the property and a, an approvable layout. So what the PUD does again is, is they approach the city with, here's the plan we want to build. This is generally what it is we want to build. We require that engineering to be done on the front end um, because then the PUD locks them in generally to developing it in that manner. Th that's the major difference between what the, the commission is here to approve, to review tonight um, would be the, the PUD does come with the preliminary development plan as part of it, whereas a traditional zoning classification would not. And your honor, to dovetail in on that one as well, I'd also note the fi findings of fact and the 10 items that are referenced there, which basically incorporates your preliminary development plan, okay. plan discussion as well. Right. I just, I, I still, I just have concerns about traffic patterns. Chairman, I have a yes, question. If, if, please. So I know you mentioned the previous actions on the property and that this was uh, zoned BP back in 2011. When it changed from ag agricultural to BP, did that come before the commission or was that done by the council or who kind of made that transition in 2011? It would have been the same process as this. It would have gone through city staff, planning and zoning commission and then on to city council. 
And so since 2011, it has been zoned as a business park. So it would have been public knowledge that this area is designated for this type of. Okay, thank Correct. you. Any other commission member comments or questions? I had a quick question. Yes, sir, Mr. Manser. On page nine of our packet here, you have the business park existing in the PUD proposed. It looks like the only difference on there is the side abutting residential district that has moved from 20 feet to 10 feet. Does it, does it uh, connect with a residential district? I guess what, what's the point of reducing that? I don't know the, the specific reason for that. As the applicant mentioned, the, the closest building to a, a property line would be approximately you know, 300, 400 feet. So I, I don't know the specific reason for requesting that 10 foot reduction. I don't know if the applicant specify that or clarify if that's even needed. Um, but as it's shown on the plan, there is no um, home that is, you know, even 20 feet from a property line. What these set is just the, the minimum. Um, and by all means, like, a, um, Unless the applicant has a specific reason, I don't know why that reduction would be needed to facilitate that. Um, these are just simply the standards that were proposed on the plans that staff received and reviewed okay. as part of that. Thank you. Yes, Vice Chair Pfizer. Um, if we approve this, is there a chance for um, kind of looking at the traffic pattern some more, or like maybe, I know we discussed the um, changing the entrance so it's not quite so far down 195th or is this kind of set in stone as far as the, the plan? We could, I mean, if, if the preliminary plat's being provided as part of the right. rezoning, then I would assume, I mean, obviously they- if So they what you're asking is, is if we approve this tonight, does the proposed streetway turn out to be exactly as they proposed it or would they look at like what the mayor suggested or do we need to request a, a traffic, a better traffic study before we make a decision? So if I understand it correctly, if, if this is approved tonight, the plan before you becomes the existing preliminary development plan for it. Um, and so it would be developed generally in that manner. Um, if, if the commission desired to look at changing that, they could certainly request that. Um, as the applicant mentioned, there were some things that we did look at. It, it's one of those things where you, you solve one <coughs> problem by creating another. Um, if you move one of those access points to solve one problem, it butts up against other safety and design criteria. Um, and so some of this, specifically with the Dean Avenue extension with that alignment study, a lot of that was considered. There were three options that staff looked at and this was determined um, to be the safest and, and the best option. Um, I'll let Carl iterate on, on how changing those access points might impact their project. But to answer your question from staff's perspective, as it's proposed, if approved tonight, those access points would be generally the, the approved access points into the development. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zur, I yeah, real quick before uh, the applicant steps back in, I just wanna make sure and clarify, it's a, not a question of approving this evening, so no matter what, you're making a recommendation that's going to be going to the city council. City council can always make their input and make suggestions as well, and I would note that many of the city council members do review your planning and zoning commission meetings in order to get a flavor of what the concerns were. Apologize for the word of the use approval. I'm, I'm, thank you. Yes, sir, please. Um, moving Commerce Drive, which is the entrance, I agree with David, he said it very well. It, it actually creates a whole bunch of other problems. But perhaps a stipulation that was more associated with work, uh, the applicant working with staff to uh, find appropriate measures to prevent or mitigate the opportunity for trucks to head east on 195th out of Commerce Drive. I would certainly be open to that stipulation. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion to dispose of this item. I guess, Commissioner Pfizer, did you want to put a stipulation on that? Is that something that would make you more comfortable with it or um, what was kind of your thought there? Maybe a little, I mean, I, I, I understand there's a lot of uh, topography issues and I know those aren't that easy to work through. So I, I understand the, the layout. I just, I mean, that's just, I guess, the concern that we've all kind of brought up and a lot of the people have brought up that 
just there's a lot of 195th Street that is is going to get truck traffic. Um, and, you know, I'm not a traffic expert, so I don't know if that's a problem, but um, um, <laughs> you put me on the spot. Um, well, I would, I'll, I'll go ahead and say I'd, I'd like to see the stipulation that there be some kind of mm -hmm. truck traffic restriction that doesn't interfere with uh, to the east of, of, the, uh, of the proposed project. And I, and I asked because if I've made a motion, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to throw that in there if that would um, help you lean one way over the other as opposed to just yeah, throwing I, out a motion I, and then rejecting it just for that one little right, caveat. No, I, I like the idea of, of limiting the traffic going that way. You know, if there's a way to do that, I think that would definitely help. You know, it'd be ideal if it were shorter, but that, that may not, just because of the location and the topography, that may not work. So um, I am open to your suggestion. So, and, and it, which brings up another question I have. The, it, does that, from the developer's viewpoint, if you, if you were to try to somehow design that to prevent eastbound movement, is there a way to make it even harder for westbound movement from lost truck drivers from wanting to take a shortcut or do something like that that would enter from the, the east and go west? I mean, I... So I, in order to prevent movement in to the park from the west or from the east going west, is, that, is there a way to restrict that through design measures? I'm sure there, I, I don't know if there's a way, I don't have a solution. Once the word gets out, they won't come that way because right, they have to go right. down and what, turn around in the we, park and come right, back or whatever. Right, we want them to come out and head and head west from, from our development. We don't want them turning east, right? Right. So all for and, that. And, but we don't want them coming from the east either. We no, want to no, somehow get yeah, the word out yeah. to discourage they, that. Yeah, yeah. So to this um, point, if they maybe got lost on J Highway and then decided to try to come west on 195th, right. how, is there a way to prevent that from happening? I mean, obviously that's yeah. it's a big ask. But and that's a big ask because if somebody, suppose they missed their turn and they got to turn around and come back in, well, they, well we too. want them to get in. We won't want them... Right, we won't want them stuck the and not be yeah. able to, to, yeah. to do anything at that point. Yeah. But I didn't know like if where the entrance is, if, if there's a way of almost forcing a right turn there for the semis, creating a right turn lane. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Would be hard. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, so I know there's a couple other communities that actually have uh, some areas in which uh, trucks are, are prone to go to. And so they actually have signage where it says no trucks over a certain tonnage and then it's enforced by the police if, if that were to happen. Yeah, Kurzweil used to be signed that way too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all saw how that went. All right, well, for the sake of the uh, discussion, uh, Chairman, if, if it's okay, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. Sure. Um, I move that the <clears throat> Planning and Zoning Commission accept the staff proposed findings of fact and forward case number 22012, the reclassification of zoning of 262.09 acres located south of 195th Street and east of Interstate 49 interchange from BP Business Park to PUD Planned Unit Development District to the City Council with recommendation for approval with the addition of the stipulation that the developer look into and try to figure out a way of mitigating truck traffic east of the property. We're working with city, city staff to accomplish that. Applicant, applicant appears to be uh, congenial to that. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Urquia, second by Vice Chair Pfizer to um, accept the staff pr uh, proposed findings of fact and forward case 22012, reclassification of zoning of 26.09 acres located south of 195th Street and east of I-49 from BP Business Park District to PUD Planned U Unit Development District to the City of Council with a rec recommendation of approval with the addition of the developer working with city staff to uh, further control truck traffic east of the project. Does that sound accurate? Mr. Zur. Although it was 262 acres, I think you said 26. So that I don't it said 262.09, but in case I didn't, thank you. <laughs> um, any discussion of the motion by commission? 
All in favor? Seeing all hands, that will pass unanimously. Eight to nothing, thank you. Could I make a comment real quick? Yes, sir, please go ahead. I'd like to thank the, the public for coming out and, and voicing your opinion. A lot of the concerns, it seems like, are more of city council concerns than they are planning and zoning concerns. So please bring those, those comments and concerns to the city council as they take more into consideration than the, the rules that, that we are making sure this development follows. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank if, you I could, answer. if I could add just for clarification while everyone's here, that meeting for yeah, this item at please. City Council will be next Monday, um, May 23rd, um, at 7 o'clock p.m. in this same room. And so I just want to get that out while these folks were still here so that they were aware of that. You could plan for that. Appreciate that. Thank you both. Uh, that will then move us on to item eight on our agenda, which is the city council report. Uh, Mr. Zer, would that be you, sir? Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to provide the city council report. Since the last meeting that you all had, there have been two city council meetings that I would report from. However, one of those city council meetings really doesn't have anything uh, pertinent to report, so I'm going to focus on the first one, which would have occurred on April 25th, 2022. During the course of that meeting, there are a number of items that were read both for second reading as well as first reading that I'll report to you on. First was the Oak Ridge Farms fourth plat rezoning. This was rezoning from a commercial two designation to an R3A designation of 9.45 acres, uh, generally commercial district uh, to the multifamily residential district. Uh, basically, it's an extension of the Oak Ridge Farm subdivision, uh, which was developed by the same applicant. You may recall considering this on April 11th meeting, which was approved by, sorry, my apologies, April 5th meeting, which was approved unanimously by this uh, proposed commission and forwarded to the city council with that recommendation. It was also approved unanimously by the city council during that time frame as a second reading. The next item was the Alera PUD rezoning and preliminary development plan, very similar to what you were dealing with this evening, except oriented to uh, residential use uh, for, for its development. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission again heard this on April 5th meeting and approved it unanimously, eight to zero. City Council took it under consideration and for its first um, consideration on April 11th, approved it by a vote of seven to one. It also received the same seven to one vote for the second go around, so it has been approved as well. <clears throat> that was the old business and second reading. The one item of new business uh, that I'd point out would be the governing body and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Mayor has agreed to continue to serve on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Members of the council uh, I changed my mind, though. Happy to have him do that. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to have him do that and did not designate a separate individual from the council to also serve. So those would be the two items I would report on from the April 25th meeting. And again, the May 9th meeting, there were second readings of a couple of those items. Um, I'm sorry, that's not right. There were no additional readings at that, at that time and nothing to report on. That would conclude my city council report as always. Um, Mr. Crass, as well as uh, Mayor Turnbow were present during the course of those meetings and I'd welcome them to provide any additional input or insight they might have. Either of you gentlemen have anything? You said you got something? I got nothing. You got nothing. Very good. Uh, city staff, staff report please. Sure, thank you, sir. Um, June the 7th, it appears there's gonna be a couple of final, plan, uh, final plats in front of you. It's still tentative at this point because we have not received the resubmittal, so we'll, we'll keep you apprised as, as those uh, applications come back in. Um, June 21st, we've received nothing for that uh, app, uh, for that meeting at this time, and so we'll, we'll definitely keep you apprised as well as, the, as things change. Um, going back to our April 19th meeting over the um, work session that we have with the future land use plan, the interactive map is now uh, live, and so just wanted to make that um, publicly available and uh, anybody who wants to go on uh, can go to raymore.com uh, backslash community and uh, there's a educational page as well as a, a place to comment on specific sections so uh, make that available and uh, let any, anybody know that, uh, that that is available. Um, finally I had a meeting with uh, the Arts Commission and the Park Board on the 10th of this month um, back to back and so uh, first meeting was with the Parks um, 
biggest thing that I took away from that uh, was that city staff is heading in the right direction, but they need to identify a park for the eastern um, section of the city uh, as there's not one that exists and they're, they're trying to make a connection um, really that trails can connect all the way over to uh, the Rock Island Spur. And so that's the biggest thing for them. Um, when it goes to uh, Arts Commission, they need to identify a funding source, which staff has started to work on, um, that when an application comes in front of uh, city staff, we can actually look and see um, what future plans the Arts Commission has for beautification or, or uh, such as a seed pod uh, specifically, and, and looking at uh, the different activity centers that we talked about and, and where they would maybe propose something to, to be located and have that be part of the pre-application meetings that we have with developers uh, into the future. And uh, that will conclude staff report. I had one item I wanted to update the commission on as well. I'm excited to, uh, it happened this month, not in April, but uh, uh, last Monday we did hire a new economic development director that uh, replaced me. So I no longer have to work double duty in both positions. But uh, Brandon Keller, uh, he comes to us uh, most recently from the city of Blue Springs where he was the economic development director there. Um, he, uh, he brings a lot of experience from the state of Missouri and Jackson County doing similar type of work. Um, and so Dylan and I have spent the last week and a couple days so far just bringing him up to speed, uh, kind of driving him around town. Uh, and so I look forward at a future date to bring him to the commission and kind of introduce him formally, uh, the same with the city council, but uh, our department is thrilled to be at full staffing again. Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Zur. I, I just really quickly want to jump in and commend the commission this evening. Uh, a couple of times I heard comments with regard to, that's kind of outside the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, you asked questions that were pertinent to, okay, so what are we in considering this evening? And so, uh, thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Zerk. Um, any final staff comments from anybody? Okay. Well, okay, you, we'll get there. Commission member comments will come in a second. <laughs> Um, we do offer public comments now um, at this end portion of our meeting, so if there are any members of the public who would like to come back in and address us, please feel free. You want me to go out and ask them? Still out there. <laughs> Looks like they're deep in conversation, so we will, seeing none moving forward, we will move into commission member comments, which I will just automatically start with Vice Chair Pfizer because she's okay. rip roaring ready to go. I'm so, so excited. No, well, no, I actually, I just attended the, um, National Planning Conference, and so I wanted to kind of give an update on that. Um, it was in San Diego, which wasn't a bad place to go, although I have to say it was cold. Um, I always needed a jacket, which was kind of a, a shock, but that's okay. Um, and so I brought my notes so I can kind of say I learned a few new phrases that were big. Apparently, housing, the housing crisis was really a big topic of a lot of the seminars this year. And uh, one of the phrases is middle housing that I did not know. And that's basically anything between um, single family homes to high rise apartment buildings. That's middle housing. And that's where the shortages seem to be according to all the uh, seminars. And so one thing I think we've done is a really good job of, of trying to address that by you know, having townhouses and apartment complexes and things that I know people think, oh, why do we have more apartments? But Apparently, there's quite a need for it, so I think uh, you know, kudos to us for approving these things. Um, another phrase that I learned was upzoning, which I don't think people would like here at all, um, and that's um, when you take, say, a, a lot that's single family, uh, zoned for single family, and you just upzone it to where you can put a duplex or um, whatever it will actually fit on it to provide more housing, um, and I think that probably wouldn't go over well, and I can understand that. Um, but it's more popular in, in crowded city areas. Um, and um, uh, let's see, AUDs, or no, ADUs, are quite a, were quite a topic this year as well. And apparently, if you build one in Washington State, you can sell it for about $800,000. Um, a typical house in uh, Bellevue, Washington, was like $3 million. So won't be moving there anytime soon. Um, same with kind of the San Diego area. It has some pretty pricey uh, neighborhoods. Um, let's see. The keynote speaker was Michael Ford. He's a hip hop architect. And um, that's kind of hard to understand in a way. It's, I wasn't quite sure I have heard of him. And um, he does a lot of work with the National Organization of Minority Architects. 
and I uh, was part of that for a while, and so I, I do know who he is and what he does, but I got a better understanding of that, and I, there's no way I can possibly explain it in a minute, so I won't. But it's really fascinating. Look up Michael Ford, Hip Hop Architect, and uh, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, and let's see. Um, next year, the conference is in Philadelphia. It's from April 1st to the 4th. So I really encourage anybody to, um, you know, plan ahead and, and go to it because it really, it's exciting and you meet a lot of planners. And I actually, usually I don't meet that many um, uh, planning commissioners. Usually I meet someone and they're like, oh, you're a commissioner, your city sends you. So it's a pretty big deal that our city does allow this. And, um, but I actually met some this year and that was pretty cool. But um, it's, um, it's just kind of fun to meet other people who, who share this you know, interest and I get all nerded out and have fun at these things. And, um, so, and you get to go to a new city, you get to tour things. I, I went to the border. I, um, we didn't cross because it takes a couple of hours to get back. Um, and I was really glad we didn't cross, but, um, but it was very exciting. So I really, really encourage everybody, if you can go next year, do it. If not, you know, I'd go every year, but um, you know, I got to share the wealth a little bit. So, just just wanted to say that. So, thanks to the to the city for allowing that. Thank you. Um, I'll just move down the line that way, Commissioner Ingert. I wanted to, first. Is any of that online? Hmm? Is any of this online? Would it be available next year? To um, it might be. Some of it's online. Mr. Grass might know. An online. Hall. There's usually a lag time. They typically do record the sessions at those, um, and then they are uploaded. They're, they're edited over the first couple of weeks to a month after the um, conference. But I, if you don't have it, I can provide you with your APA login. Each commissioner has one, and, and I can see if they did that this year. And they, they actually have a program that you have to pay a little extra <laughs> and to get this membership to get all of the sessions okay. online. Well, my comments, I'd like to tell the staff thank you for your efforts and the details. Um, you don't let me stop learning, which I sincerely appreciate. I know it's an awful lot of work and you put a lot of effort into it, and I sincerely appreciate your work and efforts. I keep moving down the line, Commissioner Kia. I uh, echo those sentiments. I always appreciate the staff and the effort you guys put in. Uh, I want to apologize again for using the word approval. I'll probably keep doing it and you'll get to keep keeping me in line, which I know you enjoy. Um, and then just one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, if you don't have the business journal, the Raymore Planning and Zoning Commission was mentioned uh, in there um, in this latest article about the uh, 20 uh, bankers to know in Kansas City, um, kind of tooting my own horn here, but it does mention the planning and zoning and my commission on that, so. Raymore got a little plug, Mayor, you're welcome. Thank you. Mayor Turnbow. Yeah, I really don't have anything this evening other than to say I might differ from Mr. Zur's opinion about the, the commission's interaction tonight. I, sitting at the council up here during council meeting nights, it, it uh, you know, I reflect back on what we talk about here and it, what we do here and how we act is, is, is as important as what the council does. To diminish that in any way, shape or form, Jeremy, is I think a, a little too lighthearted on our part and diminishes our importance when, when I think the council does have final say they look very heavily at our comments and, and we have to be very careful about what, how we indicate to the public, oh, it's just a pass through, we're, you know, we're just, I, and I know you didn't mean that in that form or fashion and you can even rebut this if you want to when it gets to be your turn. But I, uh, I, I, st I still feel like um, that the power that this group holds is as, is as almost as important if not more than because we're setting the stage for the council because they're reading our minutes and, and trying to understand our reasonings for the passage of, uh, of such a, a tough project. We, we wanna see growth, we wanna see planned growth. We understand that this, this project was, uh, was a business park uh, to begin with and that uh, PUDs we have found over the past uh, decade or so does give a degree of control by the council for um, 
memo memorandums of understanding and, and other things that we can, uh, that allows us to add flexibility, like the Alera project. You know, that was going to be a single family home project. Now it's single family homes with a lot of amenities. And some people were upset about that, that we passed on that. But it's gonna be a really nice project for the community and give a, a lot of different housing options, uh, more housing options than what were originally planned there. So what, what the planning and zoning does is really important and what the staff does is, is just as important. And I know they'll take the, the recommendations from this group and go back to the developer and say, okay, how can we massage this a little bit? And they'll think about it a little bit more. And thank you for adding that in at the end of that motion. I think that I, I, I almost voted no on the project only because I, I do feel our, the pain from the people that were here tonight. Um, and, uh, and I do think that there is an, another way to get around that, to offer them some relief. Because I, I mean, I've lived here 23 years now and, and I have seen big, you, you, you just mentioned it, Matt, you know, I've seen big trucks go down Kelly Road or Kurzweil or Horridge or whatever and, and those roads, you know, suffer from it. So while we tell them they're not supposed to go down those roads, they still do. And I, I just don't know how it can be designed. I'm sure there's a way, Dylan said, there's, there's a potential way to try to restrict that. And maybe we get back with our folks. I still feel like the, the straight across gives um, some kind of real direction uh, to, to traffic in and out of there. I, maybe they, hopefully they can work out that topography, but. That's, I'm just rambling now, so I will shut up and thank the staff for the good work that you guys do and uh, the explanations that you all give are very compelling and, and obviously from the vote this evening, uh, very meaningful as well, so thank you. Commissioner Faulkner. I hope staff doesn't ever take this lightly because I probably say it at about every meeting, but thank you to staff. Uh, we could not do this job without you, and obviously a lot of research went into these cases. Secretary Peterman. Yeah, I'll repeat, uh, staff does a good job. You guys spend a lot of time working on projects. Only thing else that I have is uh, I would, uh, th there was some conversation at one time about recognition for past services done uh, by the commission specifically. Um, if somebody's been on the commission for uh, several years, I think it's just common that there should be some recognition. So I would like to have staff explore that with, uh, with the rest of the staff and see if they can come up with something that uh, we're all volunteers and, and I'm happy to volunteer along with the rest of these people up here, I'm sure. But sometimes uh, a little bit of a bump along is kind of makes it uh, special for you for a day or so. So anyway, that's all I got. Thanks, sir. Commissioner Manser. I'm not going to rebut, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will explain. I should have been more specific when I addressed the public. Uh, couple of the things that they brought up, the, their concerns that we are not going to take into consideration would be tax revenue and uh, you know market value of the property. So I should have been more specific when I made that uh, comment, but thanks for keeping me in line. Mr. Zur, thanks for keeping us in line. Not me this time, but <laughs> thank you to the staff. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you as always to staff for everything that you guys do for us to prepare us, uh, to enlighten us, to help us educate the public as well. A um, couple of things. Um, one, thank you for all the city staff that um, helped put together the touch a truck um, a couple of weekends ago. Um, I brought my boys to that. I know Commissioner Kia and, and his son were there and uh, lots of other families were there. Those are obviously um, really great events. Um, speaking of which, we have a lot of stuff coming up. We've got some summer concerts, so make sure to check out um, the events and meetings calendar um, on the city website. Um, we're talking about June 7th, possibly having a meeting that night. That's also the first night, I believe, of the farmer's market. 
that'll be opening up that night as well. So that's going to start soon. Um, so keep that on your calendars from 4 to 7 p.m. every Tuesday night. Um, and then the only other thing I had, and it was more just um, as a refresher to Secretary Peterman, um, you, you had sent me an article recently and um, regarding, and it's always a great thing to, to potentially look at and discuss what other cities are doing. Um, I believe it was in Shawnee. There was recently some discussion regarding um, zoning as far as um, occupancy and, and rentals and subdividing homes into multi-dwelling units and stuff like that. And um, Although I wouldn't anticipate that being an issue here as Vice Chair Pfizer just had mentioned about the housing problems um, and the market, you know, what between, you know, I, I got a postcard in the, in the mail the other day, somebody offering me a ridiculous amount of money for my house and it's just a corporate company, you know, I'm not gonna name their name, but um, between corporate purchasing and subdividing individual homes and, and building out residences within res residences and stuff. I'm sure we have lots of things, you know, obviously we, we talked about the auxiliary dwelling units, um, you know, in the last couple of years, but just wanting to make sure that we, um, are well positioned to address any potential issues as far as you know concerns that might come down the pike. Um, so I don't know if Secretary Peterman has anything to add because he's the one that had mentioned it to me. I don't want to you know take away your thunder, but if you had anything to add as well on that, I've been following because I'm uh, on the the board for Silver Lake Homes and and uh, we're finding a, a huge influx of uh, corporate homes being purchased up and and uh, becoming rental uh, rental is fine um, some of them are party houses some of them are whatever may happen happen um, got concerns that the ratio is getting um, it's, it's growing fast on the the corporate owned homes it's hard to control um, our bylaws and restrictions, unfortunately, were written back in the 70s, and it takes near act of God to be able to uh, change them. We, we can never get enough people for a quorum. And, um, you know, so we sit with not being able to do anything ourselves. And I just, I just uh, had an article today that, that I probably sent to Dylan. Um, any of this stuff I've been trying to forward on, but this took place in North Carolina, I believe, where um, they they called them, um, well, they were corporate homes. Anyway, this development was, uh, had 20, 30 homes in it, and, and the uh, corporate homes also owned 16 lots and the HOA decided to, well, we're gonna take it on ourselves to uh, get involved. So they put a percentage, said you can't have more than 10% rental. So the corporate homes people got together and said, uh, no, nah, I don't think so, we'll see you in court. And the HOA was, was sued and, and lost. And uh, you know, so I don't, I don't wanna have that happen, but I think what was, talked about it I, I've talked about with few people if you if you're gonna do that as long as it's a brand new development so that's kind of our job as planning and zoning in the city staff to establish saying okay this is brand new we don't have that ratio problem to where we can only have so many rentals we put a thing in there and it must be owner occupied or some version of that and you don't have to you don't have to worry about it that there's other rental people that are involved that they're gonna come back at you and, and say, no, it was established that way and we had our, our rules and regulations in place from day one. You knew what you were getting into, so we're not gonna allow rentals. But anyway, it's an interesting thing, but it's also like playing with fire, so I'm not, uh, w we would be able to uh, keep Zur busy for a while probably. <laughs> which that's too much money <laughs> that's all i got thank you thanks sir uh, any final uh, commission member comments if not i would entertain a motion to adjourn so moved second 
I have a motion by Commissioner Arkea, second by Commissioner Manser to adjourn this evening's meeting. All in favor? Seeing eight hands, that passed unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you.